Long before the AR-15 M4 became everyone's favorite tactical carbine, there was another that captured the hearts of soldiers and civilians alike. The United States carbine, caliber 30, M1, better known as the M1 carbine. Hi, Steve from Steve M Outdoors, and today we're going to do a short and convoluted history of America's first semi-automatic carbine, the United States Carbine Caliber 30 M1, more commonly and popularly known as the M1 Carbine. It was introduced into service in 1942. Now, as I stated at the beginning of this video, um, the M1 Carbine was essentially America's first tactical carbine. Uh, one that was beloved by soldiers and civilians alike. And here she is. Hard to believe a carbine is too long to fit into the video frame, but here we are. Now, I will say at the outset of this video that the original M1 carbine spawned several variants, uh, such as the fully automatic, automatic M2 carbine and the M3 carbine, which was essentially an M2 carbine with an infrared scope. Uh, and then there were sub-variants, which included rifles that had slightly improved sights or folding buttstocks. I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds um, in this video. Consider this, as all the videos in the Short and Convoluted History series have been, just an introduction and then you can go off and go far down the rabbit hole as you like. So the story of the M1 carbine begins in 1936, actually, with the introduction of the M1 Garand. Now with the Garand, the Americans had what no other country had managed before, uh, which was basically to introduce a semi-automatic battle rifle as their standard infantry weapon across the board. Uh, there were other countries who did introduce um, automatic rifles in the past. The Russians did it in World War I with the Fedorova, but it was in very limited quantities. And the Mexicans did also introduce a semi-automatic rifle into service, but again, very limited use. The Americans, it was across the board, everyone had one. So while General George Patton uh, was probably correct, at least at the time, that the Garand was, and I quote, the greatest battle implement ever invented, it wasn't a perfect solution for all of America's soldiers. The Garand was great for the average infantry soldier who needed a full-size battle rifle to counter uh, threats, the future threats at that point, of the K-98K Mauser and its 8mm cartridge, and the Type 99 that the Japanese used, which featured a 7.7mm cartridge. Um, other soldiers who weren't regularly on the front lines, though, weren't particularly well served by it. Uh, particularly personnel like artillery, drivers, security guards, and other support and logistical troops. Uh, but even frontline soldiers like a radio and mortar men. Uh, the Garand was a large and heavy rifle, and if you've ever carried one, it's great balanced, but it is a heavy rifle. It's very much of its time. Um, and, and those troops found that carrying the Garand, because they mostly carried the rifle, they didn't use it, uh, that in the service of their duties, whether crewing artillery or even just getting in and out of a truck, could be very awkward. Uh, given that the M1 Garand seemed to catch on anything and everything from brush to their own equipment. So in 1938, the Chief of Infantry asked uh, the Ordnance Department to develop a new light rifle for these soldiers. Now, thanks to some delays in getting the formal requirements together, uh, and even though spurred into action by German aggression uh, in Europe, it wasn't until June the 15th, 1940, uh, that the program was actually initiated to develop and test the proposed rifle. Uh, fast forward a little bit to November 1940, and the Winchester Company was tasked to develop the cartridge for it, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and in May 1941, a competition was held for the country's firearms manufacturers. Uh, it didn't go particularly well because the Ordnance Department did not like any of the entries. So, going back in time a little bit, um, 
Winchester had been preoccupied in 1939 with trying to sort out their 30-odd-6 Winchester M2 military rifle, which they, for whatever reason, hoped would replace the M1 Garand, which had only been introduced into service a few years earlier. Now, that rifle was designed by Jonathan Ed Browning, the brother of some other John Browning you might have heard of. Now, they hired David Carbine Williams, a rather famous name in firearms design, uh, who was fresh out of a minimum security prison, to try and fix that rifle uh, and other designs by Browning, who by that point had died. Uh, he passed away in May 1939. The M2 ended up going nowhere, obviously, because it was never accepted into service, uh, because the Army was pretty satisfied with the M1 Garand. They didn't see any need to replace it already. Uh, but Williams contributed his short stroke gas piston system, which he had been working on for other designs, and trimmed down the weight by a couple of pounds. Now, back to May 1941, as I said, the Ordnance Department had basically nixed all the proposed light rifle designs. Now, the modified M2 military rifle just happened to be uh, show up on the desk of a Major René Studler, I believe his name was, of the Ordnance Department. And he had the bright idea of suggesting to Winchester that if they scaled the M2 down, which was now lighter, thanks to Carbine Williams' new syst gas piston system, uh, and chambered it in the new cartridge, uh, that they might have something interesting. So, William C. Romer, who uh, Fred Humiston and three other engineers uh, under the supervision of Edwin Pugsley, again, another fairly fa famous name in firearms design, uh, took the M2 and basically shrank it down and shaved off as much weight as possible and showed it to the United States Army. It was a hit. Uh, and this is kind of basically the rifle in question that they ended up with. Uh, there was some more army testing in August of 1941, and afterwards Winchester uh, took the rifle back to the workshop to scrape off basically the rough edges, uh, along with Williams, who by his own words stated that he received far too much credit for the M1 carbine. Uh, Winchester further refined the rifle and submitted it for the next round of testing in September 1941. And it wasn't even close. Uh, basically, one month later, in October 1941, Winchester got the good news that uh, they had basically won the competition. Uh, and then the war machine spooled up, thanks to Pearl Harbor, a few months later. And everyone and anyone uh, basically started producing M1 carbines for the United States Army. Uh, although Winchester designed the rifle, uh, it was actually Inland Manufacturing, who was a subsidiary of General Motors, uh, who produced the most rifles, along with companies like Rockola, who, uh, if I remember correctly, made jukebox machines, um, IBM, Underwood, Underwood being a typewriter company. Uh, over 6 million of these rifles were produced, uh, making it the most produced semi-automatic of World War II. So yes, even more than the M1 Garand. Uh, they cost about $45 a piece, which was cheaper than the Garand, which I think cost $85 to manufacture. And for the Thompson submachine gun, it cost $225 to make. So obviously the military was pretty happy with a fairly cheap carbine. So the first M1 carbines started rolling out to the troops during the summer of 1942 uh, to soldiers in Europe first. Um, at first to their, to their intended audience of the support and logistical personnel, uh, but pretty soon everyone wanted one. So officers, NCOs, paratroopers, and anyone else who could get one, either by hook or by crook, ended up with a rifle. Uh, not long afterwards, it uh, started being sent to soldiers in the Pacific Theater, uh, and despite some complaints about the stopping power of the 30 caliber carbine cartridge, um, mostly due to barrier penetration, and by barrier I often mean, you know, leaves, trees, that sort of thing, uh, it was fairly well received. Um, and one of the big reasons for that was the ammunition. Uh, it was non-corrosive. So it really kind of aided in keeping the rifles as rust-free as possible out the field, which was a fairly big issue in the Pacific, given its uh, jungle uh, 
climate. Uh, in 1944, the Americans introduced the M2 carbine, uh, which was basically a select fire version of the M1 carbine. And a year later, in 1945, the M3 arrived on the scene, which was an M2, as I stated earlier, with an infrared scope uh, known as the uh, M2 scope. M3 with an M2 scope. Uh, the night sight only had an effective range of about 70 yards, uh, but it was fairly effective and it contributed to a lot of Japanese casualties. Now, during the Korean War, the M3 carbine was eventually paired with the M3 infrared sight, so peace was restored with people who were trying to remember what rifle had what sighting system. So as you probably just gathered, the M1 carbine survived World War II and saw action during the Korean War and as well. Uh, it was loved during the Second World War, but troops seemed to be less enamored with the carbine in uh, Korea. Uh, plenty of reports at the time stated that the rifle jammed in cold weather uh, and that the heavy winter clothing of the Chinese and the North Korean troops could actually stop the bullets. And it is a 110 grain bullet. Uh, whether that's true or not, we're not certain, but uh, plenty of reports do tend to suggest that it did happen. Uh, finally, there also seemed to be a bit of an issue with soldiers not really knowing how to use the M2 carbine. Um, and it apparently took quite a bit of training and experience to use the automatic version of the M1 effectively on full auto. Now, all that said, the rifle still had plenty of fans for the same reason that soldiers during the second loved it. Small, light, handy. Now, although the M1 carbine did see some action in Vietnam, uh, primarily with police and special forces units, the writing was on the wall uh, for it once the M16 was introduced. The M16 was a light, handy rifle. Not very long, uh, by the standards of battle rifles anyway. So it was really doing the job that the M1 carbine had, but with a more effective round. Uh, and it did see a limited action in Vietnam all the way to the war's end, but its use was at that point primarily by South Vietnamese troops who had received 800,000 of the rifles from the United States. So once again, there were complaints about the rifles penetrating capability in jungle terrain. Now, the rifle does actually still see some use today, uh, mostly by police forces in countries like the Philippines, uh, reserve forces in South Korea, uh, Israel, if I recall correctly, and uh, even in primary use by Surinam and Taiwan. So the little rifle that could is still chugging along um, as the guilty pleasure of plenty of soldiers to this day. Because both rifles have M1 in their name, uh, there are a lot of people who seem to believe that the carbine and the Garand are essentially the same rifle, uh, with the carbine just basically being a miniaturized version of the Garand. Uh, that's not true. Now, uh, there are some resemblances, of course. Uh, a lot of people look at the sight and say that it's fairly similar to that of the Garand. You've got your basic rotating bolt system, which I'm not sure if you can see it here but there is a rotating bolt and it does have an op rod much like the Garand has. Um, outside of those resemblances however the M1 carbine has very different gas and feed systems. Uh, the gas system works by as I stated before a short stroke uh, with the gas being tapped off the barrel uh, through a small non-adjustable port that uh, well, the Garand uses what's called a long stroke system. And if you want to know more about the difference between long stroke and short stroke gas systems, Wikipedia has a fantastic article that is called Gas Operated Reloading, which explains the differences, differences between the two systems. Uh, the difference in the feed system should be obvious. The Garand uses the M block system with a built in magazine into the rifle, whereas the M1 carbine actually uses detachable box magazines. Uh, there are some similarities though, and it shouldn't be surprising since Winchester designed the rifle and some guy named John Guerin was occasionally associated with, with that company. Uh, along with cribbing ideas from the model or the Winchester Model 1905 rifle, uh, namely the fire control group and ammunition, uh, the gas system of the Winchester M2 Browning rifle. They also looked at the M1 Garand, which Winchester was producing at the time, and said, hey, 
We like that rifle's bolt and operating rod systems. Now, as you can see here, uh, as I stated before, the rifle does use an operating rod system, just like the Karen. Don't worry, it's unloaded. Uh, which engages a rotating bolt inside the receiver. Uh, in fact, an early prototype uh, presented by Winchester uh, in the competition uh, basically used a modified Garand operating rod. So yes, there are some similarities uh, between the two rifles, but that's like saying that the French, or French Maz 1940 and the Swedish AG42 uh, are similar because they both use a direct impingement gas system. Uh, all that said, at the end of the day, uh, the only interchangeable parts on these two rifles the bolt that holds the butt place and just check. It's the only two things that you can interchange on these rifles. So the 30 caliber carbine round was developed by Winchester and it's essentially a rimless 30 caliber update of the 32 Winchester self-loading rifle cartridge that was developed for the Winchester model 1905 rifle. That old cartridge uh, featured a 165 grain bullet and it left the muzzle at about 1400 feet per second with 710 foot-pounds of energy. Uh, by comparison, the 30 carbine cartridge had a 110 grain bullet, but it left the muzzle at 1900 feet per second with 967 foot-pounds of energy. Uh, so it's an obvious upgrade of the parent cartridge. The knock on the M1 carbine has always been its ammunition, which I think most people would describe as little more than a glorified pistol caliber round. Uh, I, I think that's a little unfair. Uh, one must remember that the rifle itself was created to sit in between the M1911A1 pistol and the M1 Garand. It's obviously not going to be as powerful as the 30-06 round for the Garand, uh, but it does deliver a fairly respectable amount of energy, uh, 626 foot-pounds of energy at 100 yards, which is actually greater than that of the 45 ACP assuming you're actually going to hit anyone at 100 rounds with a pistol. Uh, yet despite that, there are plenty of stories, perhaps mostly apocryphal, uh, that American soldiers during the Korean War would fire at Vietnamese and Chinese troops in frigid temperatures and have their rounds basically bounce off the frozen quilted jackets of their enemy. Now, I don't think anyone has conclusively proven either way that this actually happened, but I actually will be exploring this question in a future video, i.e. once it's winter up here. Now, I will say that though research for this video has shown that the round does have problems with barrier penetration, and during jungle warfare uh, in the Pacific, bullets weren't particularly good at going through thicker vegetation. Frankly, I think the most realistic range, though, that you should expect to engage in combat with this round is 100 yards, and I think 50 yards is probably most optimal. You know, I've always had the theory that the reason why American soldiers were noticing rounds not penetrating brush is because they were firing at longer ranges with a rifle and a, a round that really weren't designed for that in the first place. Now, although the rifle, the ammunition, sorry, was designed specifically for the M1 carbine, there are plenty of rifles and even handguns which have been chambered for it uh, for both small game hunting and defensive use, and made by companies ranging from Frankie, Taurus, Ruger, Marlin, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head, and several companies are producing ammunition, part of partisan and Cellier and Balot. So, the legacy of the rifle. Um, you know, from a rifle that was originally thought up just to give to support and logistical personnel in the United States Army, the M1 carbine has actually a pretty colorful history. You know, the Germans had a great affection for them uh, and used them whenever they captured them. Uh, the Viet Cong, who captured them from the French and the South Vietnamese, inf outfitted entire units with the M1 carbine. Uh, hell, even Che Guevara. Uh, carried an M2 carbine. Uh, you can still find them in use in several countries, like I stated earlier, basically ranging from Taiwan, Italy, Brazil, Bolivia, and the list of former users is longer than I could care to mention, but among them you even find Canada, France, Congo, Burma, and Saudi Arabia on it. So what is the rifle's legacy? Uh, 
you know, I'm probably stretching it a bit by saying that the existence of the M1 carbine and its non-full power round can be thanked for the eventual existence of the M uh, rifles like the M16 and the M4. But I think it is fair to say that some of the brain trust of the American military realize that the average soldier might just as well be or better served by a carbine uh, that wasn't uh, chambered in a full power round like 30 odd six or you know 762 by 51. You know that the advantages were obvious to a, a rifle carrying a smaller round was that soldiers could carry more ammunition in the same space and weight. Uh, and yes, the effective range of a carbine and a smaller round is shorter than that of an M1 Garand and the M14 rifles. But you know, many in the real uh, military realize that engagements past two or three hundred meters or yards, I guess if you're American, were fairly rare and that most soldiers really weren't capable of making that shot, even despite the American military's insistence on every soldier being a sharpshooter. Uh, it, you know, it's well known that basically since World War I that the average range of combat has been shrinking. Uh, I think it was actually down to about 30 yards during Vietnam. You know, all that said though, that the M1 Garand's legacy is a great one. Uh, it was the nation's first semi-automatic carbine. Uh, it served capably through three major wars. Uh, it made the lives of everyone from truck drivers to paratroopers easier. Um, and as much of the flack as the round gets, you know, people still use it to this day for a variety of applications, be it law enforcement or the military. Uh, it's no surprise that the M1 carbine really was America's first tactical rifle. So final thoughts on the M1 carbine. I must admit I have an outsized affection for this rifle and I've wanted one for years before I managed to pick this up late last year. Um, there isn't much about it that I don't love. Uh, I find it to be accurate and effective out to 100 yards. I love the cost of running this thing because ammunition is fairly cheap and you can reload it probably even cheaper than that. And I even love the sound of the action that it makes uh, when I'm firing. You know, I can honestly see why it was so well loved by soldiers in World War II, Korea and Vietnam and a hundred other wars uh, from other countries. It's light, it's accurate and it's damned fun to shoot. And there you have it, the short and convoluted history of the M1 carbine. I hope you found this video at least vaguely entertaining and informative. You know, as always, you know, if you like the video, please feel free to give it a like, a share, comment, you know, what did you like, what you didn't like, uh, your thoughts on the M1 carbine itself. Uh, in the description, you'll find links to both my Twitter and Facebook pages, which I update regularly. As always, happy shooting, safe shooting. Pew, 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 pew.